Greetings, my family of Evangel. I hope you're having a wonderful end of year season. You're welcome this afternoon to the Bible study for Wednesday, uh, December 30th, which incidentally is the last uh, Bible study on a Wednesday that we'll have this year, 2020. Uh, the Lord bless you as you listen. And uh, let's just start with a quick word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you. We thank you for taking us to this point, and we thank you, Lord, you continue to bless us and provide us and continue to cause us to grow from glory to glory. We open up our hearts, O oh Lord, this evening um, to what you have for us. We ask for your impartation to every heart that is listening. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you're welcome once again. And um, this is Bible study, which essentially means that we're going to give a little time to going deep into the Word of God for a better understanding, better illumination, because this is what empowers us. All right, so let's start with this quick introduction. Things that we should know already, but if we do not know, then let us know now, all right? Without faith, we cannot please God. Without faith, we cannot please God. We find this in Hebrews 11, 6. So a wise man who wants to please God wants to make sure that he has faith. Two, even when we do have faith, if without works, then our faith is dead. And there's no point in having faith that is dead. Faith is shown alive by the works that we do. We find this in James chapter 2, verse 17. Without faith, God is not pleased. And without works, our faith is dead. Now let's talk a little bit about the Father. The Father is glorified when we bear much and lasting fruit, which means the works that we do by faith, when they are found to be productive, when they're found to be effective, uh, when they're found to produce a harvest that everybody can see as a witness and glorify Him, our Father is pleased, our Father is glorified. We find this in John chapter 15, verse 8. So that's quite a bit to chew already. Uh, we begin to know what our path is to pleasing the Father. Now, to be productive requires skill in anything that we do. If we're a carpenter, we're a driver, if we're a cook, if we're a teacher, if what we do is going to be productive or effective, um, we must have the skill. And to be skillful, we must have knowledge and understanding. So one thing that produces constant pleasure with our Father is when we're skillful in His ways. And He has given us the Word, all 66 books in the Bible, all 1189 chapters in the Bible, He has given us to teach us how to be skillful in His ways. And the reason is so that we can be productive and do things that will glorify Him. So, what, what we're going to do today is we're going to dive deep in, uh, in, uh, in the book of Revelations and we'll focus on um, chapter 12. Okay? And we'll begin to see the things not just in some literary narrative. Neither is it going to be some prophetic interpretation which can go you know, different ways depending on how people's understanding of prophecy. But let's even just begin to see what God is saying, what is implied in His Word here. Because as we begin to understand the implications, then we begin to improve on our skill. So, Revelations chapter 12, starting from verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and under her head a crown of twelve stars. And verse 2 says, And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Okay, what do we see happening here? Because this looks like very strange reading. Um, the revelator in uh, the book of uh, Revelations here is saying, there, were, there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, about to be birthed, what could, about to give birth to a child. What does this mean? First of all, we must have the understanding that, hey, 
we have several realms in existence. We have the material realm or the carnal realm where we can feel with our eyes, ears, nose, uh, smell, taste. Those things are, are in the carnal realm. And there are people who actually live in that realm and um, really cannot exercise any powers or control beyond that realm. But we must understand there are realms that are beyond us. There are realms that we call heavenly realms that exist, that we cannot see, we cannot feel. But we can access these realms. We access these realms through prayer. The way we reach God is through prayer. But first of all is understanding that, yes, there are realms beyond us that we cannot see. Another and in fact more important thing that we must note is that everything material is birthed from a spiritual realm. Wow. Everything material, all the good things that we see, they are birthed from the spiritual realm. See, the Bible says, and the word became flesh. The word existed in the spiritual and it became flesh and it lived among us. You find us in that in John chapter 1. That was a blessing to all eternity. A blessing to all mankind for all eternity. And it came from the spiritual realm. All goodness that you will ever have or anticipate is birthed from the spiritual realm. That's a wisdom nugget. That is knowledge that we all must have when we understand that every good thing comes from heaven above. So our task now will be to, okay, so if I want a good thing and we know that it comes from heaven above, what am I going to do to ensure that I get this good thing that comes from heaven above? The Lord Jesus Christ had taught us to pray, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. He was saying we should pray this to the Father. So we see even here that this wondrous, this, this wonder of a thing that is happening, a woman given birth, and we're going to hear a little bit about this child that is born, is given birth in the heavenly realms. But the effect is going to be here on the earth, in the material realms. Okay, let's move on. Verse 3. Then there was another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And, the, and his tail drew a third part of the third of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Oh, okay. So we know all good things come from heaven, our health, our wealth, our provision, our beauty, all comes from heaven. And here we see the Bible is telling us that for every good thing that is planned from heaven, there is also resistance. For we see that this dragon, this terrible dragon, right from the moment it knew that something was about to be birthed, was ready to devour it. Okay, so we do have an adversary also in the spiritual realm. And that tells us, okay, the things that determine our joy or the things that determine our sadness are determined in the spiritual realm. That's why the Bible says our warfare is not carnal. And that tells us rather than getting moody and fighting each other and you know, having conflict with one another, we should understand where our warfare is. It's all in the spiritual. And so the wise thing to do will be to understand uh, what does it take to make things happen in that spiritual realm so that the good can be birthed and the evil can be kept away from your territory and i'm coming to that can be kept away from your territory so the resistance you face today the things that are causing you frustration 
they are also birthed from the spiritual realm and that is understanding and that that is why our lord you know he taught us that our warfare is not car carnal so let's move on to verse 5 and she brought forth a man child that is this wonder woman in heaven she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and the child was caught up unto god and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of god that they would feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days good so the purpose was met this child was born and the purpose in the child was to rule over all the nation and of course we can see that is why that dragon was very upset because uh, of course he did not want any uh, anything to come that will have dominion over the area where he had influence but what do we see in this verse here God has a purpose for everything he delivers to the earth so every good thing that comes from the heavenly realms onto the earth God has a purpose in it in the case of this child the purpose was to rule over the nations in the case of a wife the purpose is established in heaven for the you know for, for a child your children there's a purpose for each of them every good thing that you have has a purpose it's for us to find that purpose and line up with the purpose because when you line up with God's purpose you will prosper because you will see what God did here without asking without anything you can see that God preserves his purpose kept him with him when you are in God's purpose or whatever you have that is serving God's purpose God will protect it he will also sustain his me messengers those who do his work to help the movement of his purposes on the earth they are the messengers or his servants god will protect them and sustain them and like i said earlier if you can find purpose or you can deliver purpose you can you will prosper the moment you are able to begin to line up with his purpose so let's move on to the next lesson we see here from verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And this dragon he prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that, that old serpent called the devil, and, and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out onto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now you can see two major things that happened here. There was a war, and there was a casting out. There was a war, and there was a casting out. Territory. It's all about territory. Satan's doings were not required, not needed, not wanted in the heavenly realms where he was. And by the force of war, he was cast out of that territory, not to be able to go into that territory again. So I guess what I'm saying here is you need to understand the concept of territory in spiritual realms. Everyone has his territory. Where God sends you, where God has a purpose for you, everything God has to do with you is within your territory. And you have a right to drive anything or permit anything into your territory or out of your territory. 
that is an absolute right that you have even the holy spirit in revelations 3 20 the bible says he knocks at the door it is only leave you that he comes in so if the holy spirit who is all powerful god will not enter into your territory without your permission how dare the devil the devil has no rights to stay in the territory that you have not given him to stay so you have a right to cast him out just as michael and his angels cast him out of heaven you have a right to cast him out of your life only you must know exactly how to do it because these things are done by instrumentation or by protocol to cast him out and to keep him out to make sure that he does not have permission to operate in your territory let's go to verse 10 and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our god and the power of his christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accuseth them before our god day and night you can see one thing that satan preoccupies himself doing you see what he does is to accuse and accuse and accuse now if there was nothing to the accusations you will not find him doing it as the bible says day and night it is because these accusations bring the type of results that he wants that he keeps doing it day and night and it is because he keeps doing these things and he was cast out of heaven that the Bible says salvation and strength and kingdom of our God is now available because the accuser has been cast out. You see, operations uh, heaven operates in a very legal, strictly legal system. The fullness of righteousness is totally legal. All rules are obeyed. No rule is allowed to be broken and so if the accuser has something against somebody who has no defense then guess what happens that person has to suffer the consequences of that accusation and so satan must have a lot of accusations to make and is being successful at it because he's not being stopped by the many things that we do now we fall short of our possession when satan's accusations they stick remember where we started all wonderful things good things that are meant for us with a purpose they come from heavenly realms we also saw that this dragon wanted to eat it up even before it got to us and the way he tries to do it in our lives is to stand as an accuser before the heavenly courts. And what does he accuse us of? Things that we have done through covenant. Basically, making alliances or lining up with enemies of God. Friends of Satan, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor does he sit in the way of sinners i'm sorry does not stand in the way of sinners nor sit amongst the scoffers people who make alliances or covenants or deals with the devil or you know satanic packs satan will be the one to accuse such people and make sure that they do not get the goodness of God. In fact, we have incidents of people who sell their souls to him so that they can receive from Satan. These are the accusations that Satan has standing before God. Other things that Satan accuses men of is disobedience. Disobedience is one open way for Satan to come and have influence in a person's territory. Why? Because disobedience is the opposite 
of giving glory to the Father. The way we give glory to the Father is in our obedience. Because essentially what it means is his word expressed can be seen in you. That is obedience. When his word and his will expressed cannot be seen in you because something inside of you has blocked it, his glory cannot come forth through you. That is disobedience. And of course, Satan takes advantage of that situation and rents accusation against you and says, this person does not qualify for the goodness that is birthed in the realm for your sake. One third thing is ignorance. Satan would take advantage of our ignorance, especially when we know that Jesus said we should ask, we should seek, we should knock. Which means we keep asking, seeking, and knocking for that which God has for us, which is our knowledge, which is our edification, which is our development, which is our revelation, which is our illumination. If we keep doing that, then we are not ignorant. The Bible says, I would not that you be ignorant. Ignorance is a very powerful force that the devil uses against the children of God. So we see here that this accuser is constantly standing before God. Say, God, he's disobedient. God, he's covenanted in one way or another. Uji boards, horoscope, and those things that have to do with me, he's connected with me. Covenants, disobedience, ignorance. The accuser does that both day and night. But as we read earlier, this accuser has been defeated. The war has been fought. The child has been preserved. We have a hope. And verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. Now that is power. That is the way of overcoming the accuser. That is the way to keep the evil one, your enemy, Satan, the devil, out of your territory. And I want to delve this into these three things, the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, they love not their lives. It's not enough to just recite these things or to throw hey, the blood of the lamb against, uh, against, the, uh, against the evil one. You have to understand because remember, it's a spiritual warfare, not carnal. They are checking to see to what extent you understand what you're saying. Do you even understand the dynamics in which it works? Because for some people, they just quote words and throw out words, but they have no deep understanding of the words they're throwing. If they don't see the conviction, the understanding, the revelation, or the illumination, the light that you're projecting in the word, they won't take you serious. In fact, they'll just, you know, they just they just laugh at you. So let's go. The blood of the lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. And that is the root of it all. Legal access to the Father's realm is only by the blood of the lamb any man that is to access the father these things that are birthed from the heavenlies from the spiritual realm of god into our lives as we are today can only be done by the blood of the lamb it is the blood of the lamb that qualifies us for anything that is godly the blood of the lamb is the price that was paid for our redemption. It is the price that was paid for in the blood was the life of the Christ, the anointed one, the life of all eternity, the life of the son of the most high God is the price that was paid by the shedding of the blood and nothing compares to its worth. So there is no power in heaven on earth or on earth 
There is no principality. There is no force in heaven on earth that can match even close to the power that is in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That price has been paid. So no claim can be made that the price that was paid has not overcome. The blood of the Lamb is the advocacy of the pure, the innocent, the spotless, the holy, that is far above any existence. So it is like matching the force of something so huge in fact nothing nothing really can describe its hugeness the force of the, the the tremendous force of god against any smaller force that is what the blood of the lamb does when you have confidence in the blood of the lamb like when we take the holy communion and we drink his blood and eat his flesh and we become one with him in substance, in purpose, in who he is, in total belief, when we experientially carry that knowledge and our, that commitment in us and we demonstrate it in our passion, the enemy will know that you know what the blood of the Lamb is and what it is about. And it will be overcome next one by the word of their testimony words can be cheap and words can be spirit and words can be life jesus said the words that i speak they are spirit and they are life this dragon of this accuser is overcome by the word of their testimony. And let's focus a bit on what testimony is. What is the word of your testimony? A testimony is one who is a witness, who is a partner, can say of this story that I tell, I was a part of it, I partook of it, I am a witness of it, which means that God's word in me is in is dwelling in me with full understanding, with full acceptance. It is basically who I am. The Lord Jesus said, if you abide in me and my word in you, then you shall ask of the Father and anything that you ask shall be done for you, including overcoming the accuser so the word of our testimony is not just something we have memorized in our head the word of our testimony is something that you can say i am experienced in this word i am a witness a partaker of this word and this word has been demonstrated through me it is an experiential witness when david killed the lion the lion yes. who have no substance of the word were trying to discourage him david said i have a testimony when a bear came against me i slew him when a lion came against me i slew him this is my testimony my god was with me inside of me covering me anointing me at the time the bear came and because of that i was able to kill it it is not by my own strength. Same with the lion. And so with this uncircumcised Philistine called Goliath, I will destroy him also. When you operate like your battle is in your flesh and you're trusting in your strength and some, some rely on intrigue or worldly wisdom when you're trying to use such fleshy means to overcome you are replacing the word of testimony that is inside of you but when you decide that your battles your life your onslaught your victory shall be only by 
everything that the word of God has given unto me, and that shall be my practice, then daily and daily you begin to build a testimony that is based upon the word. And so when the accuser comes around, oh, he, he'll even be scared to come around you because he knows you know what you're talking about and you have a firm belief in the word that you carry inside of you. He knows. So even if he just tries you and you slap him with the word, just like Jesus did in the wilderness, he has to go away. He is overcome. And that is how the purposes of God in your life become manifest and you become a successful overcomer. Now let's move on. They loved not their lives. Three things. The blood, which is the access to the word, which is their testimony. And now we're talking about what they did and how they lived their lives. Jesus said, if you're going to follow him, you will have to take up your cross. If you're going to be with him, you will have to lose your life. It says, he who loses his life will find it. But the person who is not ready to lose his life, who wants to keep his life, will lose it. It's an interesting, uh, I don't know what you call it, work of opposites. What you're looking for, you don't get it unless you're ready to give it up. And of course, when you're ready to give it up, lo and behold, you get it. That's the mystery of God. And that is the mystery of victory over the accuser, the evil one. The readiness to stand alone. Oh, you want to be popular? We all want to be popular. We all want to be. We, don't, we all don't want to be rejected. We all want to be. You know, we all want to stand out as the best and the best and all that. Are you ready to stand with this testimony of the word, even if it's going to make you unpopular? When the testing time comes, when it is time for you to know, oh, this, this is truth. And everybody may not see this truth. Everybody may be going in another direction, but you know this is true. Are you ready to stand for that truth even at the risk of losing favor with those who love you, losing favor with those who have held you in high esteem, losing favor with those who have power, supposed power over you. Are you ready to take a stand for truth? That is what it means loving not your lives it doesn't mean when they ask you are you ready to die for jesus and you say yes i'm ready to die for jesus no, that's just academic uh, this thing jesus is not looking for for people who just keep dying left right and center for him he's looking for those who will stand with him who are ready to you know who are ready to forsake who are ready to go through whatever it takes as long as he is standing for christ they're ready to confront powers with the truth. That is what it means that they loved not their lives. And guess what? Those who have taken this resolve, who have decided that it is righteousness and only righteousness, truth and only truth, the way of God and only the way of God. Incidentally, or not incidental, that is in fact the principle of God, they're the ones you find standing at the end of the day just as christ said those who are ready to lose their lives are those that will gain it and you will see that that is what drives away the accuser you know it's interesting that the devil is watching those who preach teach confess certain truth of righteousness but underneath they're not really living it or they're not really acting it out or they're finding a ways around it those are the type of acts that the devil will take and use to accuse that person and so the person finds out that god's purposes god's goodness from the heavenly realms they're not just coming through 
And so they're marking time and time and time and a lot of things. Time is just going by and the things that are promises of God in their lives are not being manifest. Well, this study today shows us how the accuser works and how we can overcome. And so there's a time to repent because all knowledge of God causes conviction. All conviction will cause repentance because his thoughts are way above our thoughts. He says, come reason with me. For even though your sins were red as crimson, they shall be white as snow. Red as scarlet, they shall be white as a cloud. When we interact with God and we learn of him and our minds open up and we are willing and we are obedient, we become repentant. And when we repent, we step into another plane of receiving goodness from God. Because he says in Isaiah 1, 18 and 19, when you're willing and when you're obedient, you will eat the good of the land. And this is the land that God has promised you ever before you were born. It was there for you. It had been created in the spiritual realms. And what he's helping us to do is to take the necessary steps to bring those promises, to birth them into material realm, where as long as you are on this side of the realm, you enjoy a victorious life. So I hope you have been able to learn something, receive this invitation from the Lord today with a heart that is resolved unto his righteousness, unto his change, unto his glory, to promote you from glory unto glory. So let us pray. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for the deliverance of your word today. We thank you for the preservation of your favor upon your children, for giving us understanding, for giving us the wisdom. And I just pray that for every heart, every ear that has listened, every heart that has seen you, and has resolved, O oh Lord, to stay, take a step in your direction by the understanding of the blood by the word of their testimony and by the giving up of their lives so that they can gain it in you lord make it manifest make it a testimony in their life this last wednesday of the year 2020 for only your victory in our lives is glory unto you we thank you father in jesus name we pray well, thank you for listening, and I know the Lord will bless you. The Lord always a bless. He always blesses the attentive ear and the heart that is willing to receive and obey. That is a given. You are blessed, and see you soon. I love you, Evangel. <laughs>